Hi, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 13. In this lecture, we'll discuss rotated coordinate systems. This topic is covered in Chapter 4 of our textbook by Surway and Jouet. We've discussed vectors and their components or their coordinates before. It is important to emphasize that the components or coordinates of a vector depend very much on the coordinate system being used. Here in this picture, we see a vector, an arrow that is uh, pointing in some direction with some magnitude. And we also see a standard XY coordinate system with the X axis being horizontal and the Y axis being vertical. If you were asked to calculate the X and Y components or coordinates of this vector, you would need to know some angles. For example, you might need to know uh, what this angle here is. Uh, we can call it theta. Knowing that angle, you can do a little bit of trigonometry to find this distance here, which we might call the X component of some vector V. And then we can also figure out this distance here, which we might call the y component of this vector v. We can use sines and cosines to figure out the lengths of these. But the point is, to calculate the components of this vector, we must create a right triangle with the vector being the hypotenuse of that triangle. We need to figure out some angles. We need to know what the length of the hypotenuse is and then proceed to use trigonometry to calculate these components. Now, it is possible to actually use an entirely different coordinate system. In this picture, we have exactly the same vector as we did before. The arrow has the same length and it's pointing in the same direction. But notice the new blue coordinate system is oriented differently. It's as if we've taken the old coordinate system and we've rotated it. If you were asked to calculate the components of the vector in this new coordinate system, you would follow a similar procedure, but the results would be different. So numerically, the X and Y components would be different. Once again, you would draw a right triangle. You would now need to know this angle here, which I'll call phi now. Notice that this angle is different than the angle we were considering in the previous case. And once again, you would use sine and cosines to figure out the x component, which is this, and the y component, which would be this. The procedure of the mathematics is the same, but the numerical values of the x and y components are different. Hence, we say that the coordinates or components of a vector depend on the coordinate system being used. This is an important fact because going forward, when we talk about the components of a vector, we must carefully consider the coordinate system that is being used. In most cases, up until this point, we've been using a quote unquote standard coordinate system to discuss vectors. However, as the previous slide indicated, it is possible to rotate one's coordinate system and obtain different components for the same vector. So you might be wondering why should we um, ever want to use rotated coordinate system? Well, one reason is that what we think of as horizontal and vertical directions are not really universally defined. In fact, what we often do in defining the quote unquote horizontal direction is to simply look at the ground and define the ground as being horizontal and then the direction perpendicular to the ground is simply defined as the vertical direction. One problem is that living on a round planet, um, the horizontal and vertical directions are not universally defined. They are not the same directions for everyone. Someone that lives near the equator has a very different notion of what horizontal means. When they look at the ground, um, their horizontal direction is very different than someone that lives, for example, in the United States. And when someone in the United States looks up to the sky, looks upwards in the vertical direction, that person sees a very different sky with a different set of stars than somebody in the southern hemisphere, simply because up for someone in the United States is very different than up for someone living in Australia, for example. So this is one reason why we need to consider rotated coordinate systems and understand how vectors change. Another more practical reason is that certain problems 
by virtue of their design and the constraints involved are simply easier to analyze when we use rotated coordinate systems. We're going to now demonstrate that fact in a series of practice problems. Here's a simple practice problem that will serve as a warm-up for dealing with rotated coordinate systems. A force with a magnitude of 20 newtons is applied to a box resting on a flat surface as shown. What are the x and y components of the force vector? We have not yet discussed forces in detail in this class. We will get to that in chapter 5. But for now, just imagine there is a box sitting on a perfectly horizontal floor and somebody is trying to lift or pull this box in the direction indicated here. So some force is being applied. The magnitude of this force is 20 newtons. A newton is a unit of force. We'll discuss that in more detail. But the length of this vector for now can be thought of as 20 units. And this force that is being applied is being applied at an angle of 60 degrees relative to the horizontal. What we want to know are the x and y components of this force. As we discussed earlier, the procedure is to draw a right triangle. So we begin at the tip of the vector. We draw a line that intersects the x-axis at 90 degrees. We have an angle here. We know that the hypotenuse, which is now the vector, has a magnitude of 20 newtons. And we would like to figure out the x component this side is what I'll call f sub x, and we would like to also calculate the y component. This is a procedure that you followed many times in your homework assignments. By now you should recognize that to calculate f sub x, we're looking at the adjacent leg of a right triangle, adjacent to the 60 degree angle, and so f sub x should be the hypotenuse times cosine of 60. To calculate f sub y, we're looking at the leg that is opposite to this angle, so we need to use the sine of that angle. So in this particular case, we can say that f sub x is f, which is 20 newtons. Remember that f without a subscript, without an arrow, simply refers to the magnitude of the force vector, that's 20, uh, times cosine of 60, which gives us 10 newtons. And for the y component, that's f sine 60, which is approximately 17 newtons. This is a relatively straightforward scenario. Uh, what is important here is the procedure that we're following. The procedure is that we construct a right triangle with the vector of interest as its hypotenuse, and then we figure out the other sides of this triangle. We'll continue to use this procedure when we start discussing rotated coordinate systems. You'll see that although these equations will change somewhat, the procedure that we're following will not change. In this practice problem, we will actually use a rotated coordinate system. A force with a magnitude of 20 newtons is applied to a box resting on an inclined surface as shown. What are the parallel and perpendicular components of the force vector? So we essentially have the same box, but this time the box is not resting on a horizontal surface, rather it's resting on an inclined surface. So we have a surface that is inclined at an angle of 30 degrees as shown. We generally like to draw our x and y coordinate systems as being parallel and perpendicular to the surface, since the surface here is rotated, the x and y coordinate systems are going to end up being rotated as well. So the x-axis is still parallel to the ground, but the ground is now rotated. The y-axis is also rotated. Um, it's still perpendicular to the ground, but it's perpendicular to a rotated or an inclined surface. A force is being applied to the box. You can imagine someone has tied a rope to this box and is pulling the box in the direction indicated by this arrow. That force is being applied at an angle of 40 degrees relative to the horizontal direction. What we're interested in is the components of this force vector along the x and the y directions, but the x and y directions are now rotated. So we will refer to them as the parallel and the perpendicular directions as in parallel to the surface and perpendicular to the surface. 
to find the components of the force vector, we follow the same procedure as we did before. We construct a right triangle starting at the tip of the vector. We draw a line that forms a 90 degree angle with respect to the x-axis. And then we try to find this angle here. Given this angle here, we can define the x component of the force f sub x and the y component of the force which is f sub y, with the understanding that the x and y directions are now rotated. So a better name for them would be the parallel and perpendicular components of the force. To find this angle here, you have to do some um, geometry. It helps to notice that the base of the inclined surface is a parallel line. It's parallel to the horizontal direction indicated here. Um, the surface of the incline is a transversal. It intersects two parallel lines like so. So you should be thinking that this angle here and this angle here, or equivalently this angle here, are all equal to each other. You can think of these as alternate interior angles of a transversal. Since this angle here is 30 degrees, the entire angle here is going to be 70 degrees, as in 30 degrees plus 40 degrees. That finally allows us to calculate the components of this vector here. We can now say that F parallel, as in F sub X in a rotated coordinate system, is the magnitude of F times cosine of the relevant angle. The, relative, the relevant angle now ends up being 70 degrees. So the parallel component becomes 6.840 newtons. For the perpendicular component, or the component in the rotated y direction, we can say f sine 70. And plugging that into your calculator, you'll find that that's approximately 18.7 newtons. Here's another problem using a rotated coordinate system. Once again, a force with a magnitude of 20 newtons is applied to a box resting on a spherical surface as shown. What are the radial and tangential components of the force vector? This time we're not dealing with a flat surface. It's not a flat horizontal surface or a flat inclined surface. This time we're dealing with the curved surface of a sphere. So the slope of the surface is changing depending on where the box is located. At this moment, the box is located uh, at an angle of 60 degrees relative to the horizontal. Once again, someone has tied a rope to this box and is pulling on the box. That's what this force F indicates. And that force is being applied at an angle of 20 degrees relative to the uh, horizontal direction. We're interested in the components of uh, this vector in the x direction and in the y direction. Notice that the x and y directions are rotated. Also notice that the x direction is along the tangent to the circle, whereas the y direction is along the radius to the circle. And therefore, the x direction is often, in this context, referred to as the tangential direction, and the y direction is referred to as the radial direction. So when we talk about the radial component, we're really talking about the y component. And when we talk about the tangential component, we're really talking about the x component, but in a rotated coordinate system. The procedure that we're going to follow is the same that we followed before. We'll construct a right triangle like so. We'll draw a line that forms a 90 degree angle with respect to the x-axis. We'll try to figure out this angle here. Once we know this angle here, we use the usual procedures involving cosines and sines to find the x component or the tangential component and the y component or the radial component. Now, finding this angle here is a little bit tricky. Notice that we know this angle here but we don't really know this angle here or this angle here. Well, once again, we can use transversals and notice that the base of the circle forms one line and the horizontal line here drawn, drawn as this dashed line forms another line and the radius of the circle forms a transversal. It uh, intersects two parallel lines. 
Remember that the alternate interior angles of a transversal are equal. So if this angle here is 60 degrees, then this angle here is 60 degrees. And if this angle here is 60 degrees, the angle opposite to it will be 60 degrees. That would be this angle here, so that's 60 degrees. And if that's 60 degrees here, then this angle must be 30 degrees so that the entire angle forms a 90 degree angle. We now have what we want. So this angle here is 30 degrees. This angle here is 20 degrees. So the angle that we're actually interested in, which is this angle here, is going to be 50 degrees. Once we know that angle, we can use the usual formulas. We can say that the tangential component, which remember is the rotated x component, is f cosine of 50, and the radial component is f sine of 50. Plugging those into your calculator, you can find the uh, tangential and radial components to be 12.856 and 15.321. Notice that in this problem, just like the previous one on an inclined surface, the geometry and the constraints of the problem essentially force us to adopt a rotated coordinate system. In fact, solving the problem becomes easier if we adopt a rotated xy coordinate system. In our upcoming lectures, we'll be interested in discussing circular motion, the motion of objects along circles, and there we'll really understand why rotated coordinate systems are useful. We will find that these rotated coordinate systems will greatly facilitate our analysis of circular motion. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.